be in Mark chapter number 6 this morning. Wow. That was, a, that was awesome. That was awesome. It's so good to hear what God's doing and just how He works. And just to, we know He's good, but it's just so good to hear that and see Him working in, in our midst in such a real and powerful way. Um, so thank you, Tiffany, for sharing with us. And thank you for being a part of our church. We are, we are honored that you're here, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's awesome to worship with you and uh, get to walk with you through this journey that God has you on. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, Mark chapter number 6, we're, we're going to talk about the feeding of the 5,000. And, you know, the feeding of the 5,000 is, uh, it's, you can go a lot of different directions with it. I mean, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in, in, in this in this passage, a lot of a lot of angles you can go, and a lot of um, just a lot of lessons that we can learn from it. Um, you know, in, in in Mark chapter number six, what's going on is Jesus sends his disciples out two by two. You guys remember that story? He sends them out two by two into the in, in, into the countryside to go and to, to to tell about the coming kingdom and to heal people and to to. To share uh, the gospel with people, and and as they go out, um, the interesting thing is Jesus says, "Don't take any bread, don't take any uh, any any provisions. You know, go and if someone's mean to you, just shake the dust off and go somewhere else. And if someone takes you in, uh, you know, go there." And and, and and so it's this journey of faith. It's one of the first journeys of faith that these twelve go on as they're with. Uh, their their Messiah and following their, uh, their their rabbi and, and Jesus sends them out and they go out and, and many miracles happen the Bible says that they, they, they go out and people are healed demons are cast out all kinds of crazy stuff and so they do all that and and then they're coming back to tell Jesus and in the meantime in all this John the Baptist is executed by Herod and that's also what happens in, in, in this passage before we get to the feeding of the 5,000. So the disciples go out and they are uh, they're, they're getting ready to report back and so uh, that's that's where we're at in context. They're coming back from this, this really cool faith journey that they've been on. You see Jesus working through them in miraculous ways and they're going to tell them all about it. So that's where we're at. Now, as I'm thinking through this story, by the way, our clock's broken today, so good luck. Um, the, uh, I have several people that have promised to do one of these if I get a little too long, but some of you have already started, and I don't think that's the uh, But anyway, uh, as, I, as I'm thinking through this story, I started thinking, you know, what? what is the story? At the very fundamental bottom line, what's this story? And, and, and this story, I think, can... Is this sort of the foundation of it? There was a need that seemed impossible, and Jesus used his disciples to meet it. Right? There was a need that seemed impossible, and Jesus used his disciples to meet it. Now, we are disciples of, of Jesus. We're followers of Christ. That's what we do. We're imperfect, just like they were imperfect. We're of, uh, of little account like they were of little account. Uh, they, they were uneducated. They were normal. Ed, not that all of you. I can speak for me on that one. Uh, but, but they were normal people. I'll put it that way. Every day, go to work, work hard, make a living, rough around the edges people that were following Jesus. And that's who we are. We're, we're disciples of Christ. We're followers of Jesus. We're trying to discern what he's trying to do and we're trying to follow him. And, and so keep this in mind as we work our way through this story. There was a need that seemed impossible, and Jesus used his disciples to meet it. Now, let's dive in. So here we go in verse number 30 of Mark chapter number 6. It said, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. So they were, no doubt, they were pretty excited about this. I mean, they had gone out, and, and it says in, in Mark chapter number 6, uh, uh, in verse number 12, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. That's pretty exciting. That's 
pretty exciting. The kingdom was clearly at hand. They went out and, and, and they were coming back to report to the king of kings about what had happened. And so they, they come back and they're excited about it. And they're, they're telling him, this is verse number 31. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. So they're, they're, they're trying to tell Jesus the story of, of what happened. There are people coming in and out. Jesus' fame is, is off the charts right now. It's, it's, it's at its peak. As a matter of fact, right after our story, Jesus preaches one more sermon and his followers go from about 20,000 to about 100. That's a pretty good sermon. You can do that. If you can preach one sermon and you cut your crowd down from 20,000 to 100, you're a pretty effective ministry there, I'd say. So, I'll see what I can do. Uh, but... The apostles gathered around, they're telling them, then because so many people were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. Jesus says to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. How many to you, that sounds so amazing right now? Anybody? Anybody need this right now? You know when you finally have those moments after a busy season and you can finally get away and just be with Jesus, how, how awesome that is and how much you look forward to that? I love that. You know what? I, 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 I love Friday mornings. Friday, the office is closed on Friday. Friday mornings, generally speaking, I, I get up after I'm done praying from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that's a lie. Uh, 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. I'm just going to Anyway, after I get up, after I get up, I get a book, I get my Bible, and I go up to our, our office, and, 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 and I can open the blinds, and I can see the mountains back there, and I can, just, I can just kind of read and think and write and talk. I love that time. That time when I'm just kind of all by myself with Jesus, just, just kind of just being. Anybody else just love that? I, just, I, I need that. We absolutely need that. And the disciples needed it. They were tired. They had gone out, they had gone on this journey, and it was stressful. They didn't bring any bread, they didn't bring any money, and they were having to trust God. And God came through for them, but still, that can be stressful, it can be hard, it can be taxing. And then they come back and they're trying to tell Jesus, and they're ministering to all these people, and Jesus finally says, let's go off by ourselves and get away, and, and, and let's rest a little bit. We'll get some tea, and we'll just chill. I don't know if that's, that's in the Greek. And, and so, just come with me by yourselves in a quiet place, and let's get some rest. And you're like, awesome. That's the plan. So they went away by themselves into a boat to a solitary place. So they get into the boat and they go off to a solitary place across the Sea of Galilee. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Again, you're talking about people who are desperate. You're talking about people who realize they have needs. They were diseased. They were hurting. They were sad. They, they, had, uh, they, they, they thought that Jesus could heal them and help them and do something. And then you had the people that, that were just wanting to see the show. They wanted to see a miracle. They had heard. They wanted to see it happen. Quite honestly, I mean, that, my curiosity would have been up. I would have wanted it. I would have either wanted something fixed or, or, or I wanted to see it happen. And so all these crowds are gathered and they just take off running around the, the coast uh, to, and actually beat Jesus and the disciples to where they're going. And then they, when they get there to rest, there's a giant crowd there. It says in verse 34, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, I'm sure the disciples were like, let's sell somewhere else. Right? I'm tired. And Jesus was 100% human. He was as tired or more tired than they were. But don't you love this about Jesus? I mean, check it out. This, this is why I just love this about Jesus. When Jesus landed, saw a large crowd, I don't know. I bet the human part of him was like, Ugh. you know? Just, he was a human. He was, he was, you know? I'm sure he was like, oh, okay. I mean, maybe he saw it coming. I'm not sure how that all works. But when Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them. Don't you love that? He looked at the crowd and, and, and he, he felt for them. He, 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 he identified with their struggle. He identified with their pain. And that's what he does with us. 
I wonder, and I don't think he does, but, but I wonder if sometimes when we come to him, he's like, uh, here he is again, really? Did the same thing, Trevor, really? It's the same thing again? I mean, have we talked about this? You know, the here I am again. But he doesn't. He, he always has compassion. He fills my need. He, 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 he's there for me every single time, regardless of the situation. He loves me. He has compassion on us. Right? He has compassion on us. Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without the shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. They were just wandering. You know, you guys know what the main characteristic of sheep is, right? Anybody yell it out? They're dumb. <laughs> They're dumb. You know who's the sheep? We are. <laughs> I'll let you fill in the blanks on that one. But, but they were like sheep just wandering. Sheep, sheep will follow other sheep. If one, she they don't have a shepherd and a sheep walks off a cliff, guess what the one behind will do? It'll walk right off the cliff. Because they don't have somebody to guide them. They just wander. And, and, and that's what they were like. They were like sheep without a shepherd. They needed a shepherd. And the shepherd happened to be there. And the shepherd loved the sheep. And the sheep know the shepherd. Amen? So, they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So he sits down with them and teaches them. It's a beautiful scene. And there's upwards of possibly between fifteen and 20,000 people gathered. I know it's the feeding of the 5,000. But the interesting thing about the feeding of the 5,000 is this, that it says it was just the men that were the 5,000, that there were women and children as well. So there could have been upwards to, you know, if you, just a small family, there could have been 15 or 20,000 people that are gathered around here. And he has compassion and he starts teaching them. He's teaching them many things. Verse number 35, by this time it was late in the day. Now remember we're talking about teachable moments with his disciples, with, with us. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Ah, practical problem solving. They saw a need and they were trying to be practical about it. That's how we, that's how we do. Right? That, that's how we do. That's how we are. And do? I don't know, maybe both. Uh, but that's that's what we that's what we do. That's that's that's, that's how we act. We, we look at the situation, we think, okay, here's the need. Alright, what's the practical way to meet this need? What's the way that we can figure out and problem solve and meet this particular need? Right? It's what we do. And sometimes that works. Sometimes the need's right there, and I can I can work my way through it and with, with very little thought of anybody else but myself, I can kind of work my way through the need, and I can I can figure it out, and I can make it happen, right? That's a lot of needs. A lot of our needs we can do that with, and that's how the disciples thought. That's how I think. It's how most of us think. We see something that comes up, we look at the uh, pros and cons, and we try to figure out what to do. They saw that the crowds were there. It was getting late. They're in a remote place. So what's the answer? They need food. What do we need to do? We need to send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. That's exactly what I would have said. Maybe not, I may not have been quite that smart. It would have been something like that, though. That's how I am here if something happens. You know, if someone comes to me and they have a need, I'm like, well, here, do this, do this, do this, and voila, it'll be fixed. Right? Think through that. That's what the disciples did. Now, Jesus comes back with something entirely different. He says this, but he answered, you give them something to eat. That changes things slightly. So he says, you give them something to eat. So what's the need? The need's a big need. There are 20,000 people possibly, at least Five, possibly 20,000 people that, that need food. He had just sent his disciples out and said, don't take any bread with you. And they come to tell him about the story of how God provided, and he's telling them, provide bread for 20,000 people. Don't send them away. You feed them. And so, they're probably all looking at each other like, ha, ha, ha. That's, that's good, Jesus. But seriously, we need to send them away. It's getting late. They're in a remote place. Right? So, they said to him. Now, remember, this is the disciples. They said to him, 
That would take more than half a year's wages. Philip said this in another passage of Scripture. By the way, this is the only miracle that's found. I don't want to give away the end of the story. But this is the only miracle that's found in all four Gospels. Besides the resurrection. This is the only miracle that's found in all four Gospels. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a very, uh, uh, it was such an event that everybody remembered it. It was a big deal. And so they said to him, Philip said to him, in another passage of scripture we see, that would take more than a half year's wages. I looked it up. The median household income in Bend, Oregon, as of 2017, is $52,000. It's a medium house. So if we... If we extrapolate from that how much it would take for us, according to Philip's math, to, to feed 20,000 people enough to get them full, it would take around uh, $26,000. That's sort of what we're, it's sort of the, what he was thinking in his head, right? This is going to take a lot of money, in other words. It's like half a year's wages. That would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them? Are you serious? That's, that's what? What's a good word for that? Crazy. Impossible. Crazy. Yes, I wasn't thinking that. But impossible. Impossible. That's a need beyond which I can do. How many of you are facing something in your life that for some reason all the practical thinking and all the strategic uh, planning that you can come up with to try to solve it has done squat to solve it? Anybody facing something like that? We all do, don't we? We all do. How many of you see a need like that? How many of you have been, been brought into the loop of a need like that? And you're part of a you're part of people that are trying to help someone else that's going through something, and you're trying to help them, and you look at them, and it's like it's impossible. It's impossible. None of the practical things that should work are working. None of my brainstorming, none of the, none of the, the normal things are working. So what the easiest thing, just go somewhere else. This is hard. It's just, I can't do it. It's impossible. Right? And Jesus is facing the disciples with this. It's impossible. How can we how can we spend that much on? And so he says in verse number 38. How many loaves do you have? Alright, so they go throughout the crowd and they gather all the loaves that they have. And, 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 and I'm sure that'll help. So they go out in the crowd and they start asking people, we need your loaves, we need your loaves, we need, we need your lunch, we need what you got. And, 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 and they, they end up getting one kid's lunch. <laughs> one kid's lunch. <coughs> one kid's lunch. Do you think out of 20,000 people that were all gathered up, that one kid brought his lunch? Or do you think there's like maybe 12,000 people who had been greedy earlier today and ate their lunch? Or, or when they were coming around, the disciples were saying, do you, do you have any loaves? Like, oh, don't hear that. Anybody else? That would have probably been me. That would have probably been me. I don't have a loaf anymore, sir. It's in my mouth. All right? But he goes out, and they find, and they come back. After this, one little boy, and that's a whole other story. And, and, and I know I'm not exhausting everything, or maybe he's doing very well with what we're talking about. But, but, but I know there's other stories. Well, we can talk about the little boy later. But, but in this story, for, for what we're doing, when they found out, they said five. Five. I wonder if this next part is sarcastic. If there's some sarcasm involved. Oh yeah, and we found two fish. <laughs> Whee! Right? <laughs> that should help. Right? So, so when they found out, they said five. Oh yeah, and we found two fish too. <laughs> now we got it. <laughs> now, we got, now it's only uh, uh, five months and 29 days worth of money that we need. Right? So, so they found out and they said five loaves. That's meager resources. To meet an impossible need. Meager resources to meet an impossible need. And there's nothing that makes us realize how incapable we are that when an impossible need comes our way, we realize how meager our resources, our brain power, our abilities really, truly 
Because we can try and we can try and we can try and nothing works. And we're faced with an impossible need that, that we can't solve and, and we have meager resources. We have the equivalent of, of one lunch to feed 20,000 people. What do we do? The need's there. It's real. It's in front of us. God's brought it to us. But yet we just have a few meager resources. So what happens here? It says in verse number 39, Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. <laughs> I'm still thinking, I just, I'm kind of a, a practical thinker. I'm thinking that the disciples are going out and they're thinking, okay, how are we going to, maybe we can give everybody a taste if we break it up small enough. I mean, we have to go small. We have to go nearly molecular, but if we go really small, maybe we can give them the survivable taste of food that will encourage them to go out, like we said earlier, and get some food in the countryside. Right? That should maybe solve the problem. Alright? So, they have to sit down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now what? They give their meager resources to Jesus. Did they have doubt? They had just seen miracles done. They had just healed people. They had just seen demons cast out. They had doubts. No doubt in my mind. I don't have any doubts that they had doubts. <coughs> Their faith was probably really small about right now. But you know what they did? In spite of it all, and possible sarcasm about the fish, I'm just throwing that in there. I don't know. It would have been for me. They said, fine. Here you go, Jesus. We'll sit him down in 50. They gave their meager resources to Jesus. They didn't think anything could get done possibly. They didn't know what would happen. But they went ahead and did it. They went ahead and followed. But what they did was the resources they had, they gave to Jesus. They didn't have a lot. And maybe they didn't have much faith. But what they did have, they said, I can't, Jesus. We clearly can't. Here you go. Take, take, take what I have and do what you will. And what did Jesus do? Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. He looked to his Abba Father and he thanked the Lord for what he had and he began to break it. He blessed it, he broke it, and then what did he do? He didn't say, everybody's belly's full. He could have. He could have said, never hunger again. He could have fed them any. He could have walked personally and handed out a piece of bread to every single one of them until everybody was full. But well, what did he do? I think this is beautiful. I think it's awesome. I think it's a beautiful picture of what goes on in the church that we are a part of today. What we're doing now. And by the way, to hear Tiffany's story and to know that the need, that the immeasurable need that she had. And, and, and the, the impossibilities is just one example of God taking a situation that seemed impossible and, and, and blessing and breaking the meager resources of His people and using that to do the impossible through the enable, the inability, whatever. You know what I mean? Us! <laughs> Man, I hate to know how much of a vocabulary. It would be so much better if I did. My 40 word vocabulary is coming up woefully short this morning. But, but, but you see what I'm saying? And, and, and she has a house now. You know how hard it is to find a house in Central Oregon? It's, it's, it's nearly impossible. And she has a house. And, but, but you know what? To see Dennis and Jessica that just walked up to her and, and, and started talking to her in the midst of this thing, those aren't accidents. Those are God's people saying, I don't have much, but God, you direct me. You lead me. Here it is. I don't know if you can ever use me. I don't know if you can ever do anything through me. But here I am. Do whatever. And, and, and he prompts Dennis and Jessica to just go talk to them. And, and guess what? Dennis and Jessica, I think they're awesome people, but, but meager resources maybe. I don't know. You know? I mean, what, what, they, they, they couldn't buy her a house. They couldn't, they couldn't satisfy all of them. All they did was go up and invite her to church and just said, God, use me. And guess what? Look what God's doing. This it isn't Dennis and Jessica, uh, their power making this happen. It's Dennis and Jessica saying, here, Jesus. And Jesus saying, I'm going to perform a miracle. But the beautiful thing about you being a part of my family is I'm going to use you to see it through and to see it accomplished. Amen? We get to be a part of it. We get to see it happen. 
and we get to follow Jesus and do it. Because look what happened. Taking the five loaves and two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave it to give, gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. <laughs> I don't know if this is sarcastic too. He also divided the two fish among them. <laughs> they had bread and fish that day, you know. <laughs> You know, he can take even what we think is impossible and, and, and do, do, do the amazing things. And he took those meager resources and he not only fed them, check it out, they all ate and what? Were satisfied. They got full. They got stuffed. There was plenty. And you know what? The beautiful thing about following Jesus and being a disciple of Jesus is our resources in and of ourselves are so meager, but His are unfathomable, and, and, and there's nothing we can ever do to exhaust the resources that Jesus Christ, our Creator God, has. Let's give Him the little that we have and allow Him to do whatever He wants to with it. Because as inadequate as it may seem, and as big as the needs may seem, He knows what He's doing, and He's working miracles and doing amazing things in our midst every single day. He is worthy of our lives because He uses our lives and our resources far better than we ever could. Amen? Isn't that awesome? I could be, and, and I was thinking about this today, I am like... I mean, we all are, but I, I mean, we all know our inadequacies. I get in trouble. People say, stop talking about how, you know, stop talking about, you know, your inadequacies so much. And you're probably right. I, I probably, it's probably part insecurity. And maybe sometimes I even fish for you to say, no, no, you're great. But, uh, <laughs> full disclosure. But, but, you look at what God accomplishes. You know, I was thinking this morning... I mean, we, I have, like, it's just amazing to think what God's done through my life. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not brag, it's not a humble brag, it's none of that. It's just, just to look and to know who I am and to know how unworthy I am and yet to see what God's done through me. I don't deserve any of that. And yet I get to see it so much. I mean, I think, yeah, we, Joy and I started a church in 2000, and you still know the story, in Hermiston, in 2000, and it was for all the wrong reasons. There wasn't one good motivation for starting that church, I don't think. You know? We were, it was, it was, it was just, we did it all wrong. There's not one book in the world that would say start a church the way we started a church. Not one. We didn't know one person. We didn't have a team. It was Joy and I. We didn't know anybody. And we go and we think we're going to start this great, big, huge, amazing church in Hermiston, Oregon. You know? But here's the thing. And, and we're, we're nobody. It's not, this isn't, again, I'm just saying it's amazing what God does because today that church is meeting. It's still there. And it's into the second generation, the second pastor. They're doing some amazing things. And, and just to think I got to be a part of that. And to see it happen, to see it develop, and we all have those stories, Jesus uses our resources so much better than we do. And even when we're misguided, when we say, Jesus, here you go, he may giggle a little bit or laugh or something else, but he says, thank you, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he does things we could never do, and, and he makes, he blows us away with how he uses us. Amen? He just does. That's how awesome he is. So he blessed it, he broke it, they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. They go and they get 12. Have you ever wondered about that? Nobody knows why. They might tell you they know why, but nobody does. I've speculated. I've probably preached out this passage eight or ten times, and eight or ten times there's been a different reason why you grabbed the basket. You know? I always wondered, maybe, maybe it was so each, when the little boy who gave his lunch, maybe each, each disciple had enough, had a basket, and they could all carry the baskets back to the kid's house. I don't know. Maybe. But I wonder, 
if the, when the disciples had that basket, as they were walking back with a basket full of bread and fish, if they wondered, if they thought back to just a couple of days, of, a week or two before that, when Jesus said, I want you to go out to the countryside two by two, and I don't want you to take any bread. You won't have any needs. I'll meet your needs. And I wonder if some of them, when they were going off, thought, how are we going to eat? How is this going to work? How is this going to happen? And at the end of this whole thing, as we're trying to tell Jesus about the story, they end up on the other side. They end up gathering 12 baskets. I wonder if as they were walking, if a few of them were contemplating the fact and saying, you know what? I really don't have any needs. Jesus is not. Whatever Jesus tells me to do, he's going to meet my needs. I don't need bread. I need him. And he'll take care of the rest. I just wonder. I just wonder if maybe that's it. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Now in conclusion, Jesus multiplied the meager resources that the disciples gave to him to meet and exceed the impossible need that they were facing. What's the need in our life that Jesus has brought to us? Maybe it's your need. Maybe it's someone else that has the need. Or someone else that's draining your resources. Or someone else that's, that's just, just a group of people. Or something. Whatever it is. Maybe it's sickness. It could be a, a hundred different things. I can't project that onto you. But when you have that need, you know what it is. Let me just encourage you. As it seems impossible. And as it seems difficult. And you say, I am not equipped for this. Give your meager resources to Jesus. Share your need with the body and let us bear your burdens with you and let's see what God will do when we can't, but we know that He can. Amen? I can't help you. I can't make anything better. I can't do that. But what we can all do is say, Jesus, we can't. Here's what we have. You take it and do whatever you want with it. Let Guide us, lead us, help us that we follow you and see it through. Amen? Amen? We serve a great God. And at the end of the day, when all stripped away, Jesus is sufficient. He is enough. Amen? Dear Holy Father, Lord, we thank you for this story. We thank you for the fact that not just that you're enough, Sometimes maybe that's a cop-out for us to get out of things or to get out of the situation. Well, Jesus can help you, so maybe that's it, Lord. But Lord, more than you being enough, and, and not, not more than you being enough, but with you being enough, thank you for letting us be a part of the miracles that you work. Lord, the finding of a house, the giving of food, the furnishing of a house, the, all the things that you do, through your body. Thank you that you don't just make them appear. But God, that you use us to see those through. So you draw us closer to those around us. And you draw us closer to you. God, thank you so much for letting us be a part of your family. As imperfect as we are, bringing us all together to bear one another's burdens, to meet one another's needs, and to trust you with the meager resources that we have, knowing you can take, you can multiply, you can satisfy, and you can exceed. God, help us around here as we pick up the scraps of the amazing miracles that you've done, as we hold the baskets of the miracle, of the leftovers of the miracles that you've accomplished. And as we look and gaze in amazement at what you're doing around here, that, that's to no fault of our own. Lord, that, that you just take us and use us and do amazing things. As we look at the results of that, God, encourage us, fill our hearts with faith, and God, help us to continue to just say, here you go, Lord. Here am I. Send me. We'll give you the praise. God, we love you. We thank you for all you are. Thank you for loving us and letting us be a part of the unfolding drama of redemption. In Jesus' name.